Please be opening your Bibles to the Old Testament and to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. There are always things to learn, no matter how much you already know. And there are those things of which we should be reminded. That's clear from the short memory all of us have in our attempts to keep in mind what ought to be there. With those comments, let's note the first three verses of the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Of all the Old Testament prophets, I suppose I can say that many of us may identify with Jonah. And if you think that you do not, then maybe you've misexamined yourself. Because Jonah was told to do one single solitary thing. Go preach to the people of Nineveh. Now, these were Assyrians, they were not Jews, and they were the enemies of the nation of Israel. But nevertheless, God told him to go preach to the people in Nineveh, the capital city. He was told to go preach to them because they were in sin, and if they did not repent, then they would be overthrown. But what did he do? Well, instead, he ran away from his responsibility. I let that sink in, and that's the reason I say that sometimes maybe this book of Jonah fits better with most members of the church. Unless you can say that you have never, ever, never, ever dodged out on a responsibility that you have to the Lord as a child of God. Well, you know that we have responsibilities all around us today, incumbent upon every one of us. Secular work, the work that's involved in the home, certainly the work of the Lord's church, of which we are individual members in particular, if we be Christians. There's our general work out here in society. So there's work on every hand. There are obligations to be discharged. And I think this is why the book of Jonah is a very practical book, sort of like the book of James in the New Testament when it comes down to daily Christian living. It has some wonderful lessons that we need to have in our lives so that we can better serve God under the authority of Christ in His church today. First of all, let's notice that he attempted, that is, Jonah did, he attempted to run from God. Well, one of the first things that we ought to understand early on in life is that you cannot run from God. You can attempt to do it. You can attempt to dodge out on the obligations God and His Word lays upon you that only you can fulfill. And you can try to run from God, but you can't do it. And notice God gave Jonah a job. Well, why wasn't it done? Simple. Jonah didn't want to do it. It's just that simple. There's nothing else to put there as to the reason Jonah did not discharge his obligation. He simply did not want to. So what was the result? Well, he ran from God. Or at least he thought he was. So we see in these verses that he finds a ship going to Tarshish, which we understand now was over in Spain, and he's over in the Mediterranean area, uh, that is, over in the eastern part of it. So he pays good fare. You know, some people will pay money to run from God. He did. 
He might not have been at that expense if he had been just willing to do what God told him, but, but he paid money in his attempt to run away from God. And by the way, he chose the fastest way of traveling that day and time and to go as far away as he thought you could get. Maybe he thought that, well, if you get that far away, he'll choose somebody else. Because Jonah would have known that you can't run away from God in the sense of go where he has not in this world. So he ends up on this ship. Well, you know, God was on that ship before he was. God was in Tarshish, which he never got to as far as I know. And we find then that a storm comes upon the ship and threatens to sink it. And of course, all the people on there, most of them idolaters, are crying out to their God. And before it's over and done with, Jonah simply says, I'm the reason the trouble's on the ship. Throw me overboard and everything will be all right. Well, they do. They throw him into the water. And this great fish God had prepared swallowed him. Now, here's what's interesting. Jonah was under God's observation all along, never was out of God's uh, sphere of being able to deal with him. In Job 34, verse 21, Elihu correctly declares, in this case, for speaking of God, his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings, his doings and goings. In Proverbs uh, 15 and verse 3, the inspired writer says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Then coming over to the New Testament and the letter to the Hebrews brethren, chapter 4 and verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And then in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 23, Jesus declares to the churches, I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. There's no hiding anything from God. You may attempt to do so, but know before you start that's an impossibility because he already knew about your attempt. God sees all things. He knows all that we are because he's omniscient. There's no place that we can hide from him. Now we may be sure of this too. When God calls upon us to discharge an obligation to him, it being our own personal responsibility and we can't cast it off on anybody else, we can know that he knew we could do it or he wouldn't have called on us to do it. He's not going to lay any obligation on you or me or anybody else that it's impossible for us to discharge. We have that in the beginning. So when something comes our way, we know we must do it to be pleasing to God. It may look rather difficult, but the thing we need to know is that God knows I can do it. So let me be busy about it. But another point comes up that we can learn from these first three verses. You cannot run away from your own problems. Can't do it. You may think you can, but you can't do it. Did Jonah have a problem? Well, yes, he did. His problem developed because he knew that the people of Nineveh were the enemies of Israel. And Jonah did not want to preach to the enemies of Israel. He knew and he says so that if they repented, I know God will forgive them. I don't want that. But now notice this was a problem of Jonah's own making. He did not have the same attitude toward these lost people that God did. He just didn't. So this was something he developed himself. So many times we are in problems of our own making. Many times it may even be like Jonah. We're unwilling to carry out the will of heaven for whatever reason that we might have. And thus we're in a problem. But we still want to think of ourselves as fully acceptable to God and very pleasing in his sight. But we know there's an area of our life 
that is simply not submissive to the will of God. Well, that is a big problem because that brings about frustration. If such a thing is not uh, tempered and changed, we harden our heart. It doesn't bother us that much later on. And finally, it doesn't bother us at all to completely violate something because that's the process whereby the inward man is made numb to the will of God. So Jonah tried to run away from it. Jonah created his own problem. But notice what his solution was. Don't deal with it. Just run from it. Brethren, this world is full of people like that. They've made their own problems. And they're running from it. That's the solution. Husbands and wives, things don't go as they think it ought to go. Problems come up, bills, this, that, and the other. And one or both just say, whew, they're gone. Problems come up within families, boom, just run from it. Go somewhere where they don't know me. Go somewhere where we don't have these problems. Whether well, somebody else got to where it is you're wanting to run to before you ever got there, and that being is your adversary, the devil. And can you tell me a place in this world you can get to that there aren't people who are sinners? And, of course, weak people and near-do-wells and some strong people in service to God, although they're very much in the minority. But if everything was all right and going according to Hoyle, as the old statement goes, when you got there, it could be that the problems arise. <laughs> So we've got to realize you can't run away from your own problems. They're with you wherever you go. I've seen this over the years in churches. Members get all bent out of shape over something. You know, Jonah did. And they pull up and head from where else. They forgot one thing. Their person went with them. And their attitude went with them. And their mindset went with them. And their problems went with them. People don't think that way. They actually think they can run away from their own problems. And how many times in our lives do we create our own problems and then the way we would settle them is to walk away? Just get far away and that's it. I don't find that in the Bible and you don't find it in your Bible either. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, Paul wrote, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The law of sowing and reaping. You sow, you reap. It's dependent upon what we, by our own will, choose to sow. But we're going to reap whatever it is, and we're sowing daily. And by the way, we'll be held responsible for what we do with the problems we create. Accountability to God is always before us as long as we're in possession of our faculties and responsible for what we choose to do and not do. Romans 14 and verse 12, Paul wrote, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. It's far better to resolve our problems according to God's will. That's true solution. And do so now with the help of God's word and faithful brethren. Then let God resolve them in the day of judgment with his divine justice. In other words, they will be resolved. We can resolve them under the mercy and care of God, under the gospel and faithful brethren who all seek the mercy of God through the gospel, or God will solve them when it won't do us any good on the day of judgment. John 12, 48, as you're familiar, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now watch, God resolved Jonah's problems for him. But it wasn't any way Jonah would have had it happen. But God resolved them. God's mercy can be rejected. But it's a foolish thing to do so. By refusing God's word, laying the obligation on him to go preach to the people of Nineveh. By not having the love of those lost souls that he should have had. He finds himself thrown into the sea in the middle of a storm and a great fish swallows him. Now, it couldn't have been very good quarters down there. <laughs> the horror of it all. 
Jonah realized his, that his belief that he could outrun God was simply a, a lie that he told himself and it served his purpose for the moment. But it backfired very quickly. And again I say notice how God corrected the whole thing. He, he realized then it was also a problem to forsake God's mercy. And in the belly of the great fish, Jonah prayed to God. He's after that mercy again. And one of the things to learn in this day and age is to learn to enjoy God's mercy. Be thankful to God for His mercy. Folks, we need mercy. And as part of being like Christ as Christians of Christ, members of His spiritual body, is to show mercy. To be merciful to others. Now, to be merciful to others means I recognize this other person is pulled upon, has sinned, has not been what they ought to be. Now, do I want to deal with that person as Jesus dealt with sinners by being merciful? Or do I want to deal with them as if there's no mercy in existence? Because as I deal with them, so God will deal with me. Do I need mercy? Well, the honest answer is yes. Then what about this person? It's not a matter of one having sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, including you, me, everybody else. It's a matter of the mercy of God and our being members of the church as Christians also showing forth that same mercy and concern. Jonah 2, verse 8, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Interesting statement. Well, in answer to his prayer, Jonah was vomited out by the fish on the shore. Well, how often do we reject God's word? And again I say, thereby reject his mercy. When we reject the obligations his word lays upon us that only we can perform, then don't expect his mercy. Paul speaks concerning those who love lies more than they love the truth. He wrote this to the church in Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. Here's what he wrote. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Well, what about that? For this cause, that they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, on the surface, that may sound like, well, God's made it where these people can't be saved if they want to. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying if this way is the way of truth, then if something else is more important to you to cause you to turn from this way, which is the way of truth, then there's nothing else out there to turn to but error. And if you don't love the truth, you're bound to love something else. But if this way is the way to truth and salvation, and you don't want to enter it, then where are you going to turn to but to a lie and deception? And so when people don't love the truth, they don't follow it. And when they turn from it, they turn to something else, folks. And thus, they turn to a lie. We cannot afford to reject God's truth. There's nothing out there that can make us free but God's truth. There's no way to heaven but through God's truth. John 8, 32. So we're in effect are rejecting freedom from sin and liberty in Christ when we reject the truth of the gospel, God's power to save us. We need to humbly accept His mercy in accepting His word and understand the obligations His word lays upon us and from the heart discharging those obligations. We learn that personal prejudices must not interfere in preaching God's word to others. Now, Jonah was very, very prejudiced against the people of Nineveh. He didn't want to preach to them. They were the enemies of Israel. And later on, not that many years later, they would actually carry, by God's providential punishment of the northern kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom into captivity. But his prejudice caused him to run off. God called him back, though, to do the job. I like to think of this, too. Here is a man that has some very uh, in-depth shortcomings. And yet God worked with him, even as he used him to work with others. Isn't that amazing? 
that he was able to take the person who rebelled against preaching the truth of these people because he didn't love them, didn't want them saved. And this shows a flaw in Jonah's life, and yet God, in the process of getting him to go over there and preach, works with him and causes him to see his own shortcomings and weaknesses and the need to repent and go on and do what God told him. God doesn't show favoritism today. We may, and we often do, but it's not right. In Acts 10, 34 and 35, you'll remember what Peter said concerning the uncircumcised Gentiles' right to be obedient to the gospel. He said, of a truth I perceive. That's an amazing statement. Of a truth I perceive. It had been revealed to him from God's mind to his that it's not just Jews that have a right to the gospel, but everybody. God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Then Paul, or rather James, writing to members of the church, said, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. The gospel today is to preach to be preached to every creature under every heaven, under heaven, and we may say in every generation. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Mark 16, uh, 15 and 16. Another point we need to know. When God's word is preached, those with honest and good hearts will repent and obey the truth. There may be just few of them that will do so, but they will. When you read Luke 8, and you notice in verse 11 that the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And you see the different uh, soils or minds in which the word was sowed or the people that were taught. You'll see in verse 15 that it says those with honest and good hearts are the ones that bring, receive the word and bring forth fruit. Well, that always will be. You say, well, I, I thought this person was honest and good, but he didn't obey the truth. Well, he's not honest and good. <laughs> Honest and good-hearted people will always repent of their sins and obey the truth. If they don't, then they've given up their honesty and their goodness. And they hold the truth in unrighteousness. When, we, when he got there, uh, that is, when he got to Nineveh, finally, after all the ordeal, it took him to get there, and the great lesson he had to learn, the message that we're told he preached was very brief. It probably is, in my judgment, uh, just part of what he preached. But the, it's the force of it. Yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. Now they had to know it was because of the sins. Well, that's the reason God sent, them, sent Jonah there is to tell them. It's because of your sins it's going to happen. But nevertheless, he was good at what he did. And that was the extent of his preaching. He emphasized you've sinned 40 days. If you don't repent, you will be overthrown, period. It wasn't a positive message, was it? Well, it was positive in saying this is what's going to happen. But it was one that certainly didn't give good thoughts to the mind of the people. And folks, listen, it wasn't meant to. A person in sin shouldn't feel good in his sins. It's the obligation of every Christian in striving to reach other people that they're caused to realize their lost condition. The person in Christ who sins and won't repent is said to be made ashamed of himself for his sins. And this is what had to be done with these people. But they believed God through the preaching of Jonah, and they repented. Well, today we have the glad tidings of Jesus Christ, the gospel to preach. But you know, everything in it is by no means a, a positive thing. Paul warned Felix of the judgment to come, and the scripture says of Felix that he trembled, Acts 24 and verse 25. The good news is that we don't have to suffer condemnation. God's made a way for the forgiveness of sins. God has given us a, a state that we can get into through belief and obedience from the heart to the truth to where we stand reconciled, justified with the expectation of when we die to go to heaven. But many refuse to believe the message. But I say again, the person with a good and honest heart will believe, will spend their lives living for the Lord. The people of Nineveh repented. That means they had an honest and good heart. 
Well, we ought to be very happy when people leave their sins, repent, and turn to God. But look at Jonah. When Jonah, Jonah saw that uh, the Ninevites had repented, he pouted and he sulked. He wasn't a happy camper <laughs> because his enemies had repented and he knew the mercy of God and upon their genuine repentance, God had forgiven them. And he even wished to die because of his sad situation. Well, it was his own problem, a problem of his own making. He could blame nobody but himself. But God's continuing to work with him too. So God, uh, in the heat of the day, prepares a gourd that runs a vine up for a shade. And Jonah is so happy because the sun's off his bald head. And uh, he's, he's happy about that. Well, but God's going to teach Jonah something. God taught Jonah that he ought not to be upset over something that really doesn't belong to him in the first place. And that is the souls of men. Because the souls of men belong to God. God created them. God wants those souls to be saved. God is not slack concerning his promise of the Lord to return again. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9. But he's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, you see, God had this merciful attitude toward the sinners down there in Nineveh, but he had that same attitude toward Jonah also. So he has other lessons he's teaching Jonah while he uses Jonah to teach other people. Luke 15 and verse 10 says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Every time I think of somebody that reveals they repented of their sins, confessed their sins, and asked for the prayers of the church, or somebody is baptized into Christ for the mischief of sins, I know something's happening in heaven. There's joy in the very presence of the angels over that one sinner that's come home. After Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep, here's how he concluded in Matthew chapter 18, 14. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And God wants us to rejoice when he rejoices and for the same reason. In John 4, 36 we find, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto it life eternal. Then he says that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So as the song says, um, we come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Let us rejoice over those who are saved, regardless who they may be. But let us be sure we fulfill our obligations to God in teaching them the truth. We also learn that the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Now we know the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. We know that Jesus was angry at one time. But you have to know the difference in anger. Jesus had righteous indignation at people who would do the things they were doing and still claim to be on God's side. We tend to get angry because it's a personal slap in our face and we don't like it. Lord never, you never find in the Bible where the Lord became angry at anybody for treating him in a bad way. He never did. But he, came, he became very angry when people would uh, treat the way God worked with people in a bad way or attribute to God things that were not of God. And that was being indignant at people's sins. It didn't cause him to act in a way as to hurt them, but it caused swift and harsh rebuke on his part to open their eyes to their sins. At the end of this <clears throat> account of Jonah, I say again, Jonah was angry. Now, why was he angry? He was actually angry at the people for repenting. He'd, for repenting, he'd rather have God destroy them. That's why he ran in the first place. God is that merciful, and I preach to them, and they repent. He's going to forgive them. He was also angry with God, of all things, for destroying the gourd that had grown up there to shade him. Anger is a problem we must all deal with in this life. We are people who are self-controlled. And I'm not saying that all anger is bad. But the thing that usually works in anger, as that makes us angry, is not the things that make God angry, even as it was with Jonah. There are some good reasons to be angry, but there are many more wrong reasons, wrong reasons, I say, to be angry. James 1, 19 through 20, 
Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. If you try to be slow at those things, some things you ought to be fast at it. But in this case, you ought to be slow at it. Then you have time to think, keep yourself under control. In Ephesians 4 and verse 31, he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Notice, be put away from you. It's not going to get away from us till we put it away from us. It's not going to be any other way. No wagi- uh, waving of a magic wand and it's just gone. Each member of the church has to resolve, I will not engage in this activity. Now it's being put away. Jonah's anger wasn't hurting anybody but Jonah. And that's the way it is with us. Another point, God instructs man through providential preparations. God instructs man through providential preparations. Now, he prepared several things to deal with Jonah so he could deal with the Ninevites. First of all, we see that he prepared a great fish, verse 17, chapter 1. He prepared a gourd, chapter 4 and verse 6. He prepared a worm, verse 7, the same chapter. And he prepared an east wind, Chapter 4 and verse 8. All of that was involved in teaching Jonah a lesson. Now it's amazing because you come to Jesus' day and we see extreme prejudice among the Jews toward Samaritans and Gentiles and even Jews who were publicans and others they considered to be contrary to the tradition of the fathers. They never had gotten the message of Jonah. Been there with them all that time. But they hadn't learned. Today we have the word of God to teach us. But in the working of things, as God is in control of all, he, he may providentially teach us as well as to how to apply that word. Consider Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. He says to those Christians, and, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint or fall by the way, when thou art rebuked of him. Well, why is that? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you know anything about Roman scourging, that's not a little paddling. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? We have such a strange view of pain and problems. It's always an enemy to us. It's always, why me? But if you're faithful to God, then it means that these things fit in the divine scheme of things. Do we see where they fit? Consider also Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, I doubt Jonah had much thought of anything when he was cast in that sea, but I'm dead And I I don't know what he thought when that great fish was swallowing him. Swallowed him whole. There he was, three days and three nights, in the belly of the great fish. He walks out of that mess, and yet the whole thing's working for his good. All of it's changing the inward man of Jonah, and he doesn't recognize it. So God prepared these things so that Jonah could learn. So that Jonah could learn. You know, we do learn through experience. And not a very many times pleasant schoolmaster or schoolroom. At least we should learn by experience. Well, there are many great lessons I think we all recognize in, in the book of Jonah. And these are not all of them. But I hope we'll consider them. You can't run from God. You can't run from your own problems, many of which we've created ourselves. But you can reject God's mercy. However, it's foolish to do so. We cannot allow our own personal prejudices to keep us from preaching and practicing the truth. When God's word is preached, we know that those with honest and good hearts are going to repent of their sins. And above all, as we obey the truth, we ought to be happy when people turn to God. 
We also know that the anger of man and usually doesn't work the righteousness of God. Thus, self-control is so important and a real willingness to understand what's said here. God instructs man through his word. But in, the last point we made is that he also instructs us through our experiences, providentially dealing with us as with children. It may be that we've been taken to the woodshed. It may be that it's not that. It may be that just things are happening. And they're terrible and they're hard, but the question all you need to all you need to question is, am I faithful to God? If I'm faithful to God, then these things are my teachers to make me see areas that need to be fortified, that need to be developed, that will draw me closer to God. Well, of course, that's true if we receive the teaching. If we won't receive the teaching, there's, there's not much that can be done. You do notice that after these things happened to Jonah in his attempt to run from God, he did will to go ahead and do what God told him to do. Now, he didn't have to do that even after he burped up on the seashore. But he still willed to learn from that experience and go on about doing it. Though he had other things to learn, he learned those later. He learned that much, and in learning that, there's another step taken that will lead him on to learning other things. So if we don't learn from the things that are happening now, maybe we'll never have the opportunity to learn greater things in the future. If you're not a Christian, we hope you'll fully believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, as the Bible teaches. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of sins and become a Christian. The child of God, we urge you to humble yourself in the mighty hand of God. Walk the straight and narrow way, and if you have sinned, turn from that sin in repentance. Come confessing it. We'll pray with you and for you, and God has promised to hear and forgive. If you're subject then to the blessed invitation of our Lord through the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.